Approach to respiratory distress. Respiratory distress is characterized by the increased work of breathing, such as tachypnea, retractions, use of accessory muscles, and abnormal breath sounds. It is a common pediatric emergency, accounting for approximately 10% of ANE visits in children's hospitals and 20% of hospitalizations. It is important to promptly recognize respiratory compromise in children, as they can decompensate rapidly. Compared to adults, kids have smaller airways, increased oxygen demands, decreased reserves, and inadequate compensatory mechanisms. Respiratory failure results when respiratory efforts cannot maintain adequate ventilation or oxygenation. Respiratory arrest is the most common cause of collapse in children. Disorders in any system can cause respiratory compromise. Respiratory causes include infections, obstruction, chest wall and thoracic abnormalities, trauma, embolism, and injuries. Cardiovascular causes include congenital heart disease, heart failure, cardiac tamponade, and infections. Severe anemia and sequel crises are some hematological causes of respiratory distress. Hypoventilation due to neurological insults, abdominal trauma, distension, and aspiration of gastric contents can result in respiratory compromise. Metabolic causes such as acidosis, hyperthyroidism, and hyperammonemia can result in respiratory distress. A detailed history can point to the cause of respiratory distress. A sudden onset commonly is due to infective causes, especially if there is also fever. A sudden onset associated with trauma or chest pain may be due to a pneumothorax. A gradual onset can suggest heart failure or metabolic causes. Chronic stridor can be due to anatomical aberrancies. Associated symptoms can narrow down the diagnosis. Infective causes commonly have fever, URTI symptoms such as cough, runny nose, hoarse voice. Chest pain can occur in pneumonia. Abdominal pain may indicate that the respiratory distress is due to gastrointestinal causes or metabolic problems. Angioedema with respiratory distress suggests anaphylaxis. Symptoms worsening with exertion or position changes can indicate a cardiac cause. Recent trauma can cause potentially life-threatening tension pneumothorax, hemothorax, or flail chest. One should also check if there had been any exposure to new drugs, foods, and other precipitants or allergens such as weather changes and animals in cases with acute respiratory distress. A past history of previous recurrent wheezes and atopy such as allergic rhinitis and eczema points to asthma or bronchial hyperreactivity. Asthmatic patients have an increased risk of pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum. Chronic lung disease in ex-premature babies increases the risk of infections. A family history of atopy or heart disease can suggest the same cause. Vaccination can eliminate certain etiologies such as epiglottitis. A feeding history in a young child, such as gasping for air, vomiting and choking, worsening tolerance during feeding, with gradually worsening respiratory distress, can suggest heart failure. Polyuria and polydipsia can indicate metabolic causes. In the examination of an acutely sick child in respiratory distress, do an initial rapid assessment to quickly identify life-threatening conditions which will require immediate and aggressive interventions to stabilize the child prior to a complete history of physical examination. This includes severe or rapidly progressing upper airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and respiratory failure. Check the vital signs, temperature, respiratory rate, pulse oximetry, heart rate, and blood pressure. Normal respiratory rate and heart rate are generally inversely proportional to age. Fever itself can increase the respiratory rate by about 7 breaths per degree rise. Conversely, apnea and bradypnea can be seen in neonates and infants due to respiratory muscle fatigue, neurological causes, or severe metabolic acidosis. Oxygen saturation should be more than 95% in room air. Tachycardia can be caused by respiratory distress or fever. Bradycardia, however, suggests impending arrest. Look at the general appearance of the child. Is the child toxic? Are there dysmorphisms? Is the child well hydrated? A hypoxic child may be restless, anxious, or combative. Hypoxia can also manifest as somnolence or lethargy, along with cyanosis if severe. Children may assume positions of comfort to maximize airflow such as the sniffing position with upper airway obstruction or tripod position in lower airway obstruction. 
The drooling or dysphagic child is likely to have severe upper airway obstructions along with no audible voice or cough. Listen also for audible abnormal respiratory noises such as wheeze, stridor and grunting. Look at the child's breathing pattern. Rapid shallow breathing with prolonged expiratory phase is seen in asthma. Kussmaul respiration can be seen in metabolic acidosis such as DKA and shame stoke respiration can be seen in neurological causes. The degree of respiratory distress can be seen from the use of accessory muscles, retractions, nasal flaring, hate bobbing, tracheal tugging or grunting. Look for tracheal deviation in tension pneumothorax and chest wall deformity or asymmetry. Feel for crepitus and tactile fremitus. Percast for dullness or hyperresonance. Listen for differences in air entry, crepitations, wheezes and rubs. This table shows the normal ranges of heart rates and respiratory rates in children up to 18 years of age. As mentioned, heart rates and respiratory rates are inversely proportional to age. Examine the child's circulation. Look at the perfusion, check for cyanosis and feel for the pulses. Listen to the heart sounds for regularity, muffling, murmurs, gallop rhythm to suggest tamponade or heart failure resulting in respiratory distress. Check the child's Glasgow Comma Scale. Is there altered mental status or seizures to suggest a neurological cause for the respiratory distress? Look for angioedema, signs of infection such as lymphadenopathy, conjunctivitis and tonsillitis. Be sure not to miss the abdomen for any distension, organomegaly or splinting due to pain. This is a video of a baby presenting with stridor. This is how Stridor sounds through a stethoscope. Listen to the high-pitched expiratory wheeze. Immediate stabilization is vital in the management of a child in respiratory distress. Give oxygen, relieve any obstruction, and ventilate with a bag and mask if necessary. Intubation is indicated if the child is unable to maintain adequate oxygenation such as in pulmonary disease or worsening respiratory effort. If the child is unable to maintain and or protect the airway such as in complete obstruction, worsening of partial obstruction, and impaired mental status, where there is risk of loss of protective airway reflexes and therefore aspiration. And if there is potential for clinical deterioration such as those with thermal inhalation injuries or epiglottitis. Some conditions require immediate interventions such as needle decompression of attention pneumothorax and chest tube insertion or pericardiosynthesis in cardiac tamponade. Other illnesses such as severe anaphylaxis or asthma exacerbations may require initial aggressive medical therapies. Not all children in respiratory distress need investigations. Certain conditions such as asthma, which improves with bronchodilators, do not need further tests. Some with severe respiratory distress will need an arterial or capillary blood gas to determine oxygenation and assess the need for further airway interventions such as intubation. A full blood count may be done in suspected infections. Electrolytes and blood glucose may be done in suspected metabolic causes. Imaging such as chest x-rays can be done to look for consolidation, collapse, effusions, and pneumothoraces. Inspiratory and expiratory chest x-ray or lateral decubitus films can be done for suspected foreign bodies. Lateral neck x-rays look for soft tissue abnormalities such as retropharyngeal abscess, tracheitis, epiglottitis, and croup. 
A CT chest may be needed if abscesses, masses, or loculated effusions are suspected. An urgent 2D echocardiogram may be needed to look for effusions and to assess cardiac function. In conclusion, there is a need for initial rapid assessment to determine the severity of respiratory distress and any requirement for immediate management and stabilization. Intervention and diagnostic evaluation frequently occur concurrently. Respiratory distress may not be due to respiratory causes alone. If the lungs are clear, think out of the box.